from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 1997 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Senses and Sensitivity, Neuronal Alliances for Sight and Sound, will be given by Dr. James Hudspeth and Dr. Jeremy Nathans, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators. Dr. Hudspeth, who will speak about hearing, is a professor at the Rockefeller University in New York City. Dr. Nathans, who will speak about vision, is a professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore. The third lecture will discuss the science of sound, how hearing happens. And now to introduce our program, the Vice President for Grants and Special Programs of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Joseph Perpich. Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome the students in our auditorium and the teachers and students around the country to this second day of the 1997 Holiday Lectures on Science. We're delighted you've joined us once again to hear Drs. Jim Hudspeth and Jeremy Nathans continue their lectures on senses and sensitivity, neuronal alliances for sight and sound. In their lectures yesterday, Drs. Hudspeth and Nathans took us on an exploration of the nervous system and our key senses, including sight and sound. In this dynamic universe, the nerve cell or neuron is the sun. Unique to the neuron is the synapse, which is the point of contact one nerve cell makes with another or several others. In one cubic millimeter, a billion synapses can be found containing 100 megabytes of information. Such information is <clears throat> helps the male moth find the love of its life, the female moth, by determining its, by identifying its scent. As Jim Hudspeth showed us yesterday in his wonderful exercise using a twig and branches to show us the antennae of the male moth. It's an image among many others that will linger long after these lectures are over. As our eyes and ears bring news from the outside world, the neurons in the brain are not sitting quietly. Like rock and roll, the brain is a place where there's a whole lot of shaking going on. There is constant biochemical conversation among neurons, an opening and closing of their gates known as channels, where sodium and potassium ions, for example, are whisked and shuttled in and out and out and in. From laboratories around the world, information on the roles of genes and their products in blindness and deafness is catapulting genetics to center stage. It is a veritable treasure trove, for example, in the study of a hundred or so familial, familial diseases involving hearing. Yesterday we learned of major advances in the understanding of our senses. Advances at the molecular level that wouldn't have been dreamed possible even 10 years ago. Today we'll hear in our lectures how the brain is slowly yielding its secrets through the persistent efforts of scientists like Drs. Hudspeth and Nathans, through the lightning speed afforded us by molecular genetics and cell biology. Our receptors of sound, the hair cells in the inner ears, play the key role of converting sound into signals along the pathway to the brain. In his lecture today, Dr. Hudspeth will describe how the ears works work, how the quivering bundles grab the fleeting sound waves, capturing information and holding it online for our brain to make the right interpretations of sound. Dr. Hudspeth has done trailblazing work that reveals how channels and their links on the tips of the 16,000 hair cells tune these cells to specific frequencies. If you listen closely to what he tells you today, you will never again go to a rock concert without thinking of protecting those friendly little hair cells in your inner ears. Before Dr. Hudspeth's lecture this morning, we will see a brief video. Yesterday in his video, in the video, he described how he became interested in science at an early age. In fact, he had about 200 pets through his childhood and before he went on to college. In the video today, he'll speak of the importance of giving students the opportunity for hands-on science. He has a deep commitment to teaching and reaching out to students, as you can see firsthand in his presentation in these lectures. Once again, on behalf of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, let me extend a warm welcome to everyone here and to our television viewers as we begin this second day of the Holiday Lectures on Science. I think it's the experience of many research scientists that their interest in science is formed at a very early age. 
and most of the people whom I know in the area of scientific research had already decided or at least already felt by the time they were seven, eight, nine, ten years old that science was of great interest to them. So it's obviously uh, very important that even at those very early stages and later during high school that they try to get involved in science. I'd say the most valuable thing of all if one has access to it is trying to find opportunities to work in a research lab because um, there's a level of fulfillment in actually doing hands-on science, seeing the results of your insights, the results of your failures, uh, that really allows you to decide whether or not you have a scientific vocation in a way that you can never get from passive experience. One very striking thing about people who succeed in science is that they are not necessarily, and in fact very often not, the very brightest people uh, as brightness is conveyed by classical examinations, by straight A scores and so on. The features that, at least to my mind, help make a, a, a good or a great scientist are, really are not some of the ones that our society most often points to. It isn't just enormous intelligence or enormously rapid thought, uh, but a couple of other properties are particularly important. One is, is innovative thought, thought that uh, involves oblique ways of looking at things or thought that's a bit iconoclastic, ideas that run counter to some preconceived notions that uh, in fact are based on weak data or uh, poorly examined uh, hypotheses. Another is simply perseverance. People, in order to uh, work out the details of, of scientific inquiry, need a lot of time and a lot of patience. And it's very rare that one has a sudden uh, blinding or overwhelming insight that one can promptly follow through more often one has a hunch or an intuition that one then tries to trace uh, over many months or many years until one finally has the full picture. So you have a sense that a particular uh, biological process comes about in a particular way and it's only an intuitive sense that you then try to get on paper in terms of concrete experimentation. Making that transition can be extremely hard but when it's successful it's remarkably rewarding. Good morning and welcome back. This morning I'd like to continue our discussion of our sensory apparatus by talking about hair cells. Now hair cells have nothing to do with coiffure, they have nothing to do with the kind of hair that I'm increasingly without. Uh, they instead are the cells of the internal ear that are involved in our perception of sound. They're also cells of our vestibular labyrinth that give us our sensitivity to acceleration, both linear accelerations of the sort that ensue when we move straight ahead or the linear acceleration due to gravity, and also angular accelerations of the sort that occur as a result of rotatory movements, either of the head or of the entire body. These hair cells in all these organs are united by a common embryological origin, a common structure, and a common way of carrying out the process of transduction, that is the conversion of this input into an electrical response that's forwarded to the brain. So it makes sense to consider these cells together. Now there are two broad reasons to study the internal ear. The first of these is really a matter of intellectual curiosity. The ear has truly remarkable technical specifications, of which I'll mention just a couple. You can hear frequencies as great as 20 kilohertz. That's 20,000 cycles per second. And bats and whales can hear frequencies as great as 100 or perhaps even 200 kilohertz. That's remarkable by comparison with our other senses. You well know, for example, that if you see a series of visual images repeated 24 times or 30 times a second, you don't see those as flickering images, but rather as a continuum. Yet somehow the acoustic system, the auditory system, can distinguish stimuli fully 1,000 times faster than that. The other extraordinary technical feat that the ear performs is that at the auditory threshold, the very faintest sounds that you can hear correspond to motions of the inner ear's workings through a distance of only two or three tenths of a nanometer. That's two or three tenths of a billionth of a meter, or it's also called two or three angstrom units. It's about the size of your average atom. So one wonders again how something that's made out of ordinary flesh and blood can reliably respond to such remarkably small displacements. The other broad category of interest in this uh, area of research is clinical in nature, and it's pretty obvious why. In this society, in the United States alone, there are about 30 million people with functionally significant hearing problems that range all the way from modest difficulties with understanding spoken speech through profound deafness, total deafness, that affects between one and two million people. 
There are five major causes of this hearing loss. First, there are about 100 genetic syndromes, familial syndromes, in which people have inherited deafness or an inherited propensity to become deaf. Secondly, there are a series of infections, bacterial infections such as meningitis or viral infections such as rubella, particularly early in age, can devastate the hair cells of the internal ear. Next, there are certain legitimate drugs, pharmaceutical agents such as the aminoglycosate antibiotics that are used for some infections that have as their principal side effect damage to the hair cells of the ear. There are other substances such as the chemotherapeutic agent, cisplatin, which is the main treatment for ovarian cancer that similarly can damage hearing. The fourth cause of deafness is uh, what's called acoustic trauma, that is exposure to loud sounds of whatever sort. That can be in the military circumstances, in industrial circumstances, at rock concerts, which are a little bit of both. Uh, anything of that sort can tear up the hair cells and devastate them. And finally, there's a phenomenon called presbyacusis, which means literally the hearing of old men. That's the gradual deterioration of our hearing faculty that's very widespread in our society. And it's probably compounded of two causes. First, repeated exposure to loud sounds. And secondly, deterioration of the microvasculature, the small arteries that supply the internal ear as a result of our diet. That is, it's like atherogenesis in the heart or in our other organs. Now, this degree of hearing loss has an enormous impact. It cuts across the two sexes, it cuts across racial lines, and it affects people of all ages of life. For young kids, particularly prelingual kids who haven't yet acquired speech, deafness can deprive them of the ordinary way of acquiring speech and therefore of all symbolic communication. So it's very important in pediatric practice that kids be early tested to find out whether they have in fact normal hearing or not because many kids once diagnosed as being learning, learning impaired are subsequently found simply to have difficulty with hearing. And once they have been fitted with an appropriate uh, hearing aid or have learned American Sign Language, which I'll come back to later, their normal cognitive function can reassert itself. For the elderly in our society, hearing loss has long deprived people of contacts with friends, family, and the workplace. And this uh, is a devastating uh, blow that our society is slowly awakened to. As little as 20 years ago, uh, a lot of cartoons and the like found it vaguely funny to see an elderly person sort of fumfering around, not in contact with his or her environment because of deafness. But our society has awakened over that last couple of decades to the fact that this form of sensory loss is actually quite tragic. And there's been a change in societal attitude also towards ways of dealing with it. I mean, it's the case that for the last 300 years or so, it hasn't been considered particularly funny to have glasses. I mean, half of you have glasses, the more vain people have contacts, the really vain people have radial keratotomy. But uh, the, it's not you know, a particularly amusing thing. Yet until very recently, people who were wearing hearing aids were stigmatized. It was seen as a sign of infirmity, of old age, of deterioration. And it was actually to his credit that Ronald Reagan was the first prominent public figure who wore hearing aids publicly. Mr. Clinton uh, is now doing that as well in both ears. And lastly, for people of the middle years of life, acute, unexpected hearing loss can be really quite devastating. In fact, uh, rather surprisingly, at least anecdotally, there's a higher incidence of depression and suicide than that associated with unexpected blindness. Now that seems very strange because we're such terribly visual animals. But Helen Keller, who well knew both problems, remarked that blindness deprives us of our contact with things. Deafness deprives us of our contact with people. And it turns out that the daily, minor, give and take of our conversation, such as that in this room uh, before this program began, that outside, that at lunch, and so on, that sort of contact is extremely important in sort of situating us in our so social, social uh, status reminding us who are our friends, who are our enemies, and basically just placing us uh, somewhere in our society. People who are deprived of that feel an unimaginable degree of alienation and loneliness. The other thing that the ear is constantly doing that we're ordinarily not conscious of is it provides a distant early warning system. You know that if there's a fire, you're going to hear the alarm. Or if you're crossing a street, you can hear an oncoming police car or fire engine. But a person deprived of the sense of hearing doesn't have that degree of security and feels much more concerned about potential danger in the environment. So what I'm going to do in the talk today is to discuss the cells that are responsible for this, that's the hair cells, remind you of how your own internal ears work, give you a sense of the physiological results bearing on the transduction process by which hair cells convert incoming sound into electrical responses, 
give you a model of this process, and then lastly, tell you about current work in this field and also about various ways of dealing with deafness that, uh, when it arises, both through use of American Sign Language or through the cochlear prosthesis, the so-called artificial cochlea. So I'd like to start out by acquainting you with the hair cell. If we could have the slides on, please. The hair cell is derived from the surface of the body. It's an epithelial cell, meaning that it's part of a continuous flattened sheet of cells. And the individual hair cell doesn't have the axons and dendrites that true nerve cells have and that I mentioned to you yesterday. It's simply a columnar or sort of bottle-shaped cell like this that has a nucleus at the bottom. It does make synapses of the sort that I described yesterday by which it sends chemical information from its basal surface to these nerve fibers that carry information on into the brain. And the unique striking organelle or structure that gives the hair cell its name is the so-called hair bundle, this little cluster of feelers sticking out of the top or apical surface of the cell. That's seen to best advantage by looking down on it in something called a transmission, sorry, something called a scanning electron microscope, and that's shown in the next slide. You can now see that the hair bundle is this beautifully regular structure that looks something like a pipe organ, and it has a couple of very important features. One is that the processes are not all of the same length, but in every case there's a short edge to the hair bundle, and then the processes get longer as you move across it. So the hair bundle is symmetrical about the plane of this projection. It's mirror symmetric, but it's asymmetrical along this axis because it has a short edge and on this side a tall one. And secondly, these processes don't stand bolt upright, rather they heel over towards each other to form this conical or tent-shaped structure. And that raises the possibility of interaction among these processes either along their links or at their tips. If one cuts across one of these hair bundles about halfway up, one sees two other very general features. First, the processes lie in a very regular hexagonal grid that you can appreciate here. And secondly, the processes come in two flavors. At the tall edge of the hair bundle, there's a single one called a kinocilium, which resembles the type of movable cilia or cellular hairs that are found in such places as the bronchial epithelia that help you bring up mucus or on the tails of sperm. And this is called the kinocilium, a name meant to suggest that it's capable of movements. The rest of these processes all look alike. They're called stereocilia, and each of them really consists of a cluster of actin microfilaments. And some of you may remember that actin is one of the proteins found in muscle. These filaments lie side by side like a handful of spaghetti, and they're linked together by other proteins. And then this handful of spaghetti is covered with a tubular outpouching of a cell's membrane. So the membrane fits over these individual stereociliary cores the same way the fingers of a glove invest the individual digits. Now these stereocilia are basically cylindrical along most of their length, but in the last micrometer or so, before they insert into the top of a cell, each of these stereocilia tapers, as you can see here. And as it tapers, these actin microfilaments progressively drop out by inserting against the surface. So that while there are a thousand or so up here, there are only a couple of dozen that stick into the cell's top surface. And the consequence of that is that each of these stereocilia is most flexible at its base. And one can actually appreciate that by applying a force with a small glass probe here to the tip of a living hair bundle such as this one. And when you do that, as you can see below, there are two striking results. First, the whole bundle moves as a unit. It doesn't fly apart because there are little filamentous connections among the stereocilia. And second, the individual stereocilia do not bend appreciably. They don't bow. They rather remain straight and pivot around their basal insertion. And that motion implies that there should be sliding or shearing between the adjacent stereocilia. This can be seen well by looking at this model of the hair bundle. This bundle, like a real one, has about 60 of these little stereocilia in it and a single kinocilium with this ball on the top. And as you can see, when the hair bundle moves side to side, there is a sliding or slipping motion between the tips of the adjacent stereocilia. And we'll later see the importance of that in the transduction process of this particular type of cell. Now, this isn't just a curiosity or an artifact of what's seen in laboratories. It turns out that exactly this kind of stimulation is what's involved in the excitation of a response in your own ear as you listen to this lecture now. And I want to remind you of the way in which sensory information flows along that trajectory. Sound, of course, consists of alternating compressions and rarefactions of the air outside the ear. 
And those pressure changes are transmitted down the ear canal and impinge upon the flexible eardrum at its end. The eardrum then vibrates back and forth and in turn transmits motion to three little bones of the middle ear, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, or malleus, incus, and stapes. And the last of those bones, the stirrup, exerts a back and forth piston-like motion compressing the fluids within the internal ear, or cochlea. Now the cochlea is this coiled, snail-shaped structure that you can see here with about three spiral turns to it. And this whole apparatus is about as big as a chickpea, a garbanzo bean. It's about yay big. You can see coming off the back of the cochlea, the cochlear nerve, and that's of course going to carry information into the brain from uh, the cochlea that gives information about sound. Now let's consider in a little more detail what goes on within the cochlea itself. Excuse me. Unlike a snail, the cochlea does not consist of a single fluid-filled tube, but rather if you cut along the cochlea anywhere along its spiraling length, you can see that it consists of three fluid-filled tubes coiled side by side around a common helical axis, and that's magnified up here. So each of these three compartments is full of salt solution, and these three compartments are separated from, two, from each other by two elastic diaphragms that extend the length of the cochlea. One of these diaphragms, which is called the basilar membrane, has upon it some 16,000 hair cells that extend all the way in rows all the way from the base to the top of the cochlea. Now I should say, briefly, that 16,000 hair cells sounds like a lot. It, in fact, seems that these cells aren't that rare at all. But compared to the rest of the nervous system, it's impressive how few cells 16,000 really is. This canister of salt contains, in fact, something like uh, five or six million grains of salt. And if we analogize all of this salt together to being all the neurons in your brain, of which there are about a hundred billion, then all of your hair cells can be represented by a single grain of salt. That's the proportion. So only one six millionth of your nerve cells are in fact the hair cells. So you can see that they are in fact quite rare and precious, and that all of your hearing and the subsequent analysis of sound and speech stems from the use of that small number. Let's see how they function. Here's an actual basilar membrane dissected from an animal, and you can see the beautiful spiraling basilar membrane moving up the length of the cochlea, rather like the thread on a wood screw. Now let's suppose that we could simplify this structure for the sake of, of uh, analysis. Imagine that you can uncoil the cochlea and simplify it farther by replacing the complex structure with just two fluid-filled compartments separated from each other by a single elastic diaphragm, which represents the basilar membrane. When sound pressure increases outside the ear, the eardrum and the little bones of the middle ear are pushed to the right, the stapes increases the pressure in this compartment, and the basilar membrane should be pushed down. If instead there is a rarefaction outside, the bones and the eardrum should be pulled to the left, and the suction that that creates should pull the basilar membrane upward. So you would think if you listen to a pure tone that causes the membrane to vibrate back and forth, that the basilar membrane too would simply oscillate up and down along its length, but it isn't that simple. The basilar membrane is not like a simple musical string, like say a single string on the guitar that always oscillates at a particular frequency. Instead, the basilar membrane changes along its length. At its top end, it's relatively broad and floppy. At its bottom end, it's rather thicker and tauter. So it's really like a string that varies continuously from the highest string on the violin to the lowest string on a bass. And correspondingly, when you play different frequencies, they affect the basilar membrane in different places. For example, if we play a frequency that's relatively low, like 100 cycles per second, that causes a wave of oscillation at this end of the basilar membrane. A high frequency oscillation causes a vibration down here, and any other intermediate frequency will cause an intermediate position of oscillation. So you can see that this structure has a very nice property of breaking down complex sounds, such as my voice, into their constituent components. So if I make a particular sound like ah, that has three dominant frequencies that are called formants in it. And those three frequencies would be represented at different positions along the length of the basilar membrane. Now, we can appreciate how the basilar membrane functions in analyzing still more complicated sounds by means of a video simulation that we'll now play to show what happens when you listen to something really complex. So could we have that, please? 
So here we are with a view of the cochlea. The cochlea now uncoils, and we look at the basilar membrane, and now see what happens when we play individual tones. Now a chord. And finally, something really complex. So I kid you not, I mean, this is really what's going on in your ear all the time. It's rather amazing, isn't it? This, for those of you of a mathematical bent, is rather like what's called spectral analysis or Fourier analysis. You break down a waveform into its different sinusoidal components because each and every waveform that's out there, every sound you can hear, can be described as a, the sum of a series of sine and cosine waves. And that's exactly what this apparatus does. Here's another way of looking at the same issue. In effect, the cochlea undoes the work that a piano or other musical instrument does. A piano makes a series of different frequencies by using different strings. The cochlea analyzes each of those frequencies at a different place along its length and then reports to the brain which particular tones happen to be present. What's now needed is a way in which the basilar membrane's motion can be transferred or transduced into electrical signals, and that's done, it's thought to be done, as shown here. As the basilar membrane bounces up and down, carrying with it the four rows of hair cells, the hair bundles, which are stuck into a gelatinous extracellular structure, are allowed to bend back and forth as schematized here. And again, you can get a sense of that just by a simple demonstration. Imagine that this hand is a hair cell the top of the hair cell, here's the hair bundle sticking out. Here's the gelatinous structure sitting on top. As my arms bounce up and down, you can see that the hair bundle is being tweaked back and forth. So the proximate stimulus that excites the electrical response in each and every hair cell is in fact back and forth motions of the hair bundle. You feel cheated because you were hiding behind the hair bundle, but that's what I was doing. Okay. Now, what we want to turn to next is the way in which this back and forth motion can be converted into an electrical response. And we've approached that issue by using uh, animal experimentation with the simplest animals that we can deal with, such as the ears of animals like fishes and frogs, because their hearing is very much like our own in its operation. In such preparations, one can see in the microscope the individual hair cells, their hair bundles, you may be able to see the hexagonal packing of the stereocilia and even the eccentrically located kinocilium on some of the hair bundles. It's then possible to do experiments such as this in which one applies a glass probe to the tip of a hair bundle and moves it back and forth while recording from inside the cell its electrical response. And you heard yesterday that these electrical responses or receptor potentials are the initial electrical event that later sends a signal down a nerve fiber and into the brain saying that a sound has been heard. Let me give you a brief sense of what one sees when one does such experiments. First, if one moves the hair bundle back and forth as a function of time, as depicted at the bottom here, one sees that the voltage inside the cell changes. It goes back and forth in time with the stimulus. And as the stimulus gets bigger and bigger, the response gets bigger until it saturates in both the positive or depolarizing direction and the negative or hyperpolarizing direction. And like other nerve signals inside receptor cells, this has a peak amplitude or a peak magnitude of something like 10 millivolts or a few tens of millivolts, that is, 10 thousandths of a volt. Now, because we can control the back and forth motion of the hair bundle as a function of time, while simultaneously measuring the electrical response, we can make a graph of the electrical response as a function of the displacement that engenders it. And such a graph is typically S-shaped like this. Actual data are shown here. And the point to be made about this is that the entire range of response of the cell, from the, the cell being all the way off to the cell being turned all the way on, takes place with an excursion of only two or three tenths of one micrometer. Now that turns out to be a very small excursion. This particular hair bundle is about eight micrometers high, so it means that the whole operating range over which the hair bundle is sensitive corresponds to a motion that's only that big. 
So by the time you get to this sort of motion that I typically display, we're talking really heavy metal. That sort of motion, in fact, would be potentially damaging to the ear. In fact, so sensitive is this device that the motions at threshold, the smallest motions that can be detected, will correspond to the movement of, say, the tip of the Washington Monument, which is 555 feet tall, through a distance of about the diameter of a nickel. So the thing is bending that small a distance. It's one thousandth of one degree at the threshold. Now, the electrical responses in these cells, like the other electrical responses I discussed yesterday, ensue from the activity of ion channels. And I'm not going to go through the ion channels in great detail, except to say that one can do experiments of the sort shown here, in which one moves the hair bundle, measures the currents through those channels, and then changes the ions that bathe the hair bundle to ask which flavor of ions can go through. And one finds that sodium, potassium, and calcium can all pass through this particular type of ion channel. So unlike the ion channels I showed you yesterday, these are relatively non-selective in which ions they'll let into the cell. In fact, this lack of selectivity seems to get the cells in trouble. I mentioned that one of the causes of deafness is exposure to drugs like the aminoglycoside antibiotics. And in fact, if you move a hair bundle back and forth, and measure the current through the channels, and then at this arrow, spray some of those drugs onto the hair bundle, you find that in this case, about half of the response is blocked, and then gradually comes back as the ion diffuses away. It turns out that these drugs have part of their effect of actually blocking this particular type of ion channel. And while the channel is blocked, of course, the cell is in effect deaf. It can no longer respond to sound. More interestingly, these drugs may actually trickle through the channel into the cell's interior. Because if you study how people's sensitivity to these drugs is inherited, it's not inherited from both parents. It's inherited only from the mother. And that kind of maternal inheritance typically is associated with inheritance through mitochondria, the little cellular energy factors, factories that are passed down through the ovum or the egg. So in fact, it seems that these drugs probably get into the cell's interior through the transduction channels. Once they get inside, they murder the mitochondria, and that then de-energizes the cell and ultimately causes its deterioration. One striking feature of these channels is that their activity is extremely fast. And that can be seen by abruptly moving a hair bundle. When you do that, you find that these channels begin to open in only about 5 or 10 microseconds, 5 or 10 millionths of a second. Now remember that the action potential I showed you yesterday was about one millisecond, about a thousandth of a second. So this is an event that's about a thousand times faster than that. It says that the channels are really quick to respond. In fact, it's a valuable piece of information. Because the channels are so quick to respond, there can't be any chemical mediation of this response. It's unlike what Dr. Nathans told you yesterday. There can't be A's and B's and C's. You remember all of that cascade that's used in vision has the advantage of being extremely sensitive, but it has the disadvantage of being very slow. The fact that the auditory system is a thousand times faster than the visual system suggests that the virtues of amplification have been partly dispensed with in favor of speed. How can that speed um, manifest itself? It's most likely that what's going on is something of a sort shown here in a simple model. Our idea is that these ion channels, like the others that I discussed, are proteinaceous pores. They're pores that are made out of protein. They have a hole in them. And what ions can pass through the hole, in this case sodium, potassium, and calcium, depends upon the size of the hole and the particular electrical charges that it bears. Now, the hole can be open, as shown here, or it can be closed by a little molecular gate. And the notion is that the opening and closing of this hole is controlled by tension in some elastic structure. Here it's called the gating spring. When the hair bundles moved side to side, we imagine that there's increased tension in this gating spring. The increased tension then pulls on the little molecular gate and eventually pops it open. Ions flood into the cell, and we get the electrical response you've seen before. Now, we don't yet know the identity of this molecule for various technical reasons that I'll mention in a minute. It's not yet been studied either biochemically or by molecular biology. But we do know a great deal more about it. One thing is we know how many of these ion channels there are. And that's done by a technique called noise analysis. And this is a simple demonstration of the idea behind it. If you move a hair bundle back and forth with a particular stimulus, you can imagine that the electrical response you see is due to the opening of one channel, which is either all the way closed or all the way open or bouncing back and forth in between. Or there could be two channels that are open, either none, one, or two. Or there could be 10 channels or 100 channels or whatever.
Now those records obviously look different from each other. You can tell those results apart. This is a little bit like sitting in a car and listening to raindrops on the roof. You can tell how hard it's raining. If, if it's raining very gently, you can hear distinct raindrops. And as you get more and more cascading down, the thing gradually turns into a louder and louder, but more continuous sound. And that's because the random arrival of the raindrops, in effect, averages out when there are very large numbers falling down. So by looking at the current and looking at how noisy the current is, you can see how many ion channels there are. So take a quick look at this record. This is 2, 10, 100. The actual experimental results when you move a hair bundle back and forth look like this. So how many channels are there? 100, give or take. I mean, this looks sort of like the, the simulation with 100. It turns out that each hair bundle has approximately 100 of these channels. Now, that's both bad and good news. The bad news is 100 is terribly small as a number for biochemistry. Dr. Nathans mentioned that one photoreceptor can have 10 million rhodopsin molecules. Here you've got only 100 molecules to work with, and that's why nobody has yet analyzed what this substance is biochemically. The good news is that these 100 or so channels are distributed in only something like 50 or 60 stereocilia. So there's very likely only one or perhaps a couple of these channels per stereocilium. And you might well hope that you can find some structure in the electron microscope that corresponds with that. In order to do so, you need to know first where to look. And there are a couple of experiments that bear upon that. One of them is based on high school physics. If the channels were at any particular place in the membrane, say at the base of the hair bundle right here, and this is hypothetical, the current that flows through them must also flow through the surrounding salt solution. And as you know, if a current flows through a resistance, like a salt solution, there should be a little voltage. That's called Ohm's law. So you should actually be able to measure that voltage with a pipette placed outside of the cell. And when you do that, in fact, you find that the biggest responses, here they're in millionths of a volt, occur at the beveled top surface of the hair bundle, not at the base. And that comes as something of, of a surprise. Most people would have supposed that the action takes place when you move the hair bundle down here at the bottom where these processes bend or flex. But instead, the action seems to be up here where the individual stereocilia shear past one another. Now, there's another way of looking at that same issue. This point was controversial, as results in science often are, so we examined it another way. And if you could bring up the television screen, I will show you that. This is an experiment recently done in the lab in which we took advantage of a molecule, a dye molecule, that labels or illuminates calcium flowing into the cell. Remember that calcium can flow through this transduction channel, right? So here's the top end of a hair cell. Here's the hair bundle, and you can see in this fluorescence picture the nice individual stereocilia. Here's a probe up here, which is going to move the hair bundle back and forth. And the dye molecule, which is this bright yellow stuff, lights up at the site at which calcium flows in. And what you can see is each time the hair bundle moves over, there's initially brightening up here at the top of the hair bundle. And you can even see the little streak of calcium moving down the stereocilium over here. And finally, the top of the cell body lights up as well. So this confirms, in fact, that the transduction channels are somewhere here near the tip of the stereocilium. They're not down here at the base. Calcium and other electrical signals come in up here. They diffuse down into the cell body and excite a response down there. Okay? So a group in England, uh, headed by Professor James Pickles there, found an interesting morphological structure that cor probably corresponds to the gating spring that I've mentioned to you. What was found is that at the tip of each of these stereocilia, there's a fine molecular filament attaching it to the next longer process in front. So the, stereos, the tips, or the, the so-called tip links, I should say, basically span the distance between each of these silvery poles and the next brassy pole in front of it, running along only one axis. And as you might appreciate, these are admirably positioned to open and close the transduction channels. Here's a transmission electron microscope picture showing the same thing. Here's the top of one stereocilium and this fine molecular thread extending up to the side of the next longer one. And imagine that there were a transduction channel up here or a transduction channel down there or, in fact, one at each end. Then you get a picture of something like what's shown here. At rest, the transduction channel, which is this little gate, is uh, in a position that's usually shut because there's not too much tension in this little tip link. But if you push the hair bundle in the positive direction, that stretches the link increases the tension in it, that pulls on the gate, that pops the channel open, and now ions can flow into the cell and excite a response. 
So the transduction process in this is extremely simple, but also extremely rapid. And of course, it does have some amplification, because as I mentioned yesterday, doing the work to open one channel can let in millions or tens of millions of ions, and by that means in, uh, produce an enormous uh, electrical amplification. Now, there's another consequence of this way of doing business that's sort of an odd one that I want to demonstrate for you. And that is that the hair bundle is not mechanically sensitive. Uh, sorry, the me mechanically, not mechanically simple. Instead, what is happening is uh, a, a mechanical process is occurring that's stealing a little bit of energy from the stimulus that's coming in and diverting it to the channel. And I want to show you how that can be illustrated. This represents a transduction channel. It's a rat trap. It has a gate, which can be open or closed, and it has a tip link attached to it. Now imagine that this arm is one stereocilium, and this arm is another stereocilium. Basically, a hair bundle looks like this. If you push the hair bundle to the right, the tension in the rubber band increases until finally the channel opens. And as you listen to me saying, ah, your hair bundles are going back and forth thousands of times a second, giving a rise to an electrical response. Now suppose you came up and pushed upon my arms while, you, while I was doing this. If you began to push my arms to the right, you would do some work stretching the rubber band, forced through distance. And you would actually feel that work as you pushed my arms. And you would feel the same amount of work whether the channel is closed or whether the channel is open. But imagine that you began to push while the channel is closed. And while you were pushing, the channel popped open. You would feel a slackening of the rubber band. You would actually feel my arms go soft over a particular range of positions associated with channel gating. And in fact, we observe that. If one does the actual experiment, taking a fine glass fiber of this scale and applying it to a hair bundle, one sees the following. As one pushes the hair bundle side to side, not only does the bundle move, but as you can see, the pole also flexes. By knowing how stiff this pole is, we can estimate how stiff the hair bundle is at any instant in time. And indeed, we can measure the change in the hair bundle stiffness that's associated with the opening and closing of these transduction channels. That then produces a strange nonlinearity, an irregularity in the electrical and mechanical response of the cell that I'll demonstrate next. If we play two tones of sound into the ear simultaneously, we can hear not only those two tones, but because of this nonlinearity, other tones that aren't there. This was first realized by the Italian violinist Tartini in something like 1714. And it's since been used by various composers, including Stockhausen most recently, who've actually produced pieces of music based on these interference patterns within the ear. Here's the basis of the phenomenon, namely the fact that there's not a linear or straight line relationship between how much force you apply and how much displacement you get. Instead, there's this more complicated shape due to the fact that the trap is stealing some energy each time you push the thing back and forth. So what I want to do for you is to play a simple demonstration in which I'm going to play one tone, F1, then play another pure tone that descends gradually and ask you to listen for another tone that is not there. I'm not going to play this tone. But imagine twice F1, which would be a frequency up here, take away F2. That 2F1 minus F2 would be a function that looks like this. And you'll actually be able to hear that low rising tone, even though it won't be played. So here's the first steady tone. Here's a second tone that gradually decreases. They sound very pure. And now I'll play the same two things simultaneously. Listen for something rising. Now, I don't know why you should believe me, but <laughs> it, it, it really isn't there. Now, I'll also construct a melody by the same means. Here's a constant tone played five times. Another tone, also high frequency, that's played five times with slight modulations in pitch. And now the two together, listen for a low tone. Anybody recognize that? We can't play the melody because it's copyrighted, but we didn't play it. You synthesized it in your own ears. OK? So again, this is a. This is uh, due to the nonlinearities in your ear. It's rather amazing that one is perpetually buying high-tech audio equipment for great linearity, great sensitivity, and so on, only to discover, in fact, 
that the ear distorts a great deal more than any hi-fi device does. Let me turn then in the last few minutes to the frontiers of current research in this area. And I have several points that I want to make at increasing speed as I reach cruising altitude. The first is the ear is not just a passive detector of sound. Amazingly, it's been discovered in the last two decades that the ear is actually capable of mechanically amplifying sound. And that was first discovered by the discovery by David Kemp of so-called evoked autoacoustic emissions. If you take an ordinary ear from anybody in this room and play a little click into the ear, what you would find is about 10 milliseconds after the click goes in, different ears would emit different tones of sound. This is not just sound rattling around inside an empty head. This is, honest to God, re-emission of sound from an active cochlear process. Still more remarkably, most ears can continuously emit sound. So if you take any of you, put you in a quiet room, put a sensitive microphone in your ear, you would find that sound would come out. This is the power of sound. This is the frequency of sound. And you can see a given ear emits sound at all these different frequencies. This is from a lizard, but human ears do very much the same thing. So there seems to be a tiny mechanical amplifier within the ear that constantly augments our sensitivity to mechanical inputs. When we're in a loud environment such as this one, the amplifier is mostly turned down. When we're in a very quiet environment, the amplifier turns itself way up and we become much more sensitive to sound. Sometimes it's turned up so far that like a public address system, it actually begins to howl or whine and then sound can begin to come out of the ear. Finally, I want to turn to damage to the ear. Remember that a hair bundle normally has this nice orderly structure, but as a result of aging, of drugs, of loud noises, and what have you, the hair bundle can be disheveled and finally destroyed. And if enough hair cells are devastated, right now there's no way of replacing them. There are two strategies that are being pursued, though, to make such replacement, at least functional replacement, possible. One of them is that many people hope that we can replace hair cells by making their precursors divide. And in fact, this does work in other animals, such as the chicken's ear, this is a study in which scientists damaged a little patch of the chicken's ear with loud sound. So there was, a few days before, a scar at this site where the normal hair bundles, which are these white things, were destroyed. But a few days later, as you can see, there are little miniature hair bundles growing back out again. And a few weeks later, there would be an entirely normal ear there. So one thing is that we hope we can decode the program to cause regeneration of hair cells and their replacement. In the meantime, the other thing we can do is to take advantage of the nervous system structure to artificially stimulate. We know that auditory information goes to a particular portion of the cortex, and we know the auditory pathways that take information up from the brainstem to that point. Now, these pathways have a nice, useful feature to them, which is that if we look along the pathways at any point, each frequency of sound, high frequency or low frequency, is transmitted through certain ensembles of nerve cells. So at any given point, these are all sensitive to high, these all to low frequencies. We can exploit that. The way we exploit it is by using an electrical stimulus that replaces missing hair cells. Normally, we have 16,000 hair cells here along the basilar membrane and nerve fibers carrying information from them. In a person who's become deafened, the hair cells are missing, but the nerve fibers are still there. It is possible, however, to make a, a mechanical device that will fit into the ear and electrically stimulate these nerve fibers, whereupon the brain hears sound that can be interpreted. That's the basis of the so-called cochlear prosthesis shown here that can be surgically implanted into the ear and current passed between these little pairs of electrodes. Here's a picture of the implanted device, and you can imagine that current flowing between these two would in fact be intercepted by the nerve fibers that would send a signal to the brain. And all that's then necessary is that one wear externally a device that picks up sound, sends it along a wire as an electrical signal that can be passed across the skin, and then down a wire to the stimulating device in the cochlea. And I want finally to play you a demonstration that gives you a sense of the fact that you can actually discriminate some sound from such a poor device. This is a brief conversation that will be presented with only six bands of sound, only six frequencies left. We've thrown away everything else. So, preparing a lecture, how would you say it was to be the sponsoring four talks on sensory sound testing as this year's holiday lecture? That sounds like a valuable way to claim the students with interest in the results pertaining to the sensory. It's pretty opaque. This is the same thing now with 12. So, preparing a lecture, how would you say it was to be the sponsoring four talks on sensory sound testing as this year's holiday lecture? That sounds like a valuable way to claim the students with interest in the results pertaining to the sensory. You get a few words? 
Now 20, which is about equal to the number of channels that a current prosthesis has. What are you doing? Oh, preparing a lecture. Howard Hughes Medical Institute is sponsoring four talks on sensory transduction. It's this year's holiday lectures. That sounds like a valuable way of acquainting students with interesting new results pertaining to the senses. And lastly, the whole thing. What are you thing. doing? Oh, preparing a lecture. Howard Hughes Medical Institute is sponsoring four talks on sensory transduction as this year's holiday lectures. And blah, blah, blah. So the point is that this, this greatly attenuated sound still functions. There are 15,000 people worldwide who now wear these prostheses. 15,000 people who heretofore had had no hearing at all. They were totally deaf. They could understand this lecture. They could understand telephone conversation. So it's a terribly effective sensory uh, replacement structure. I want to say finally that it's a sensory replacement that has its own problems. And in particular, it's a threat to the deaf community. The deaf community is not simply a group of people who have hearing problems. It's a culture. It's a culture that since roughly the time of World War II has enormously elevated itself through its own efforts, much as has the African American community. And as a result of this, there is a strong sense of identif identification with this culture. And people who are deaf worry about the impact of the cochlear prosthesis. They worry that their children will be taken out of their culture and made into something else by wearing these devices. It's a little bit as if I said to you, look, you're, you're black, you're white, you're yellow, or whatever, but we can now change that medically. Or you're Protestant, or you're Muslim, or you're Catholic, or you're Jewish, but medical science can change it. I mean, it's not something you want changed. It's at the core of your personal identification. And so in fact, the deaf community has a right and has a very good rationale for being concerned about the impact of the prosthesis. And it's something we're going to have to deal with over the next few years by generating people who both have prostheses, but also have learned American Sign Language, which is itself a rich and fluid language, and are capable of mediating between these two groups so that each can be most impressed with the other's virtues instead of feeling any sense of animosity. Thank you very much for your attention. We have a few nanoseconds for questions. Yes? I was wondering, what is happening in your ears when they're ringing? The question is, what happens in your ears when they're ringing? And in some instances, the ringing in the ears, in fact, represents overly exuberant oscillation of the amplifi amplificatory process that I mentioned. The amplifier is tuned up too far. Uh, in my own ear, I have continuous ringing on this side as a result of getting hit with a soccer ball when I was in 11th grade. And it's been humming along ever since then, like a, uh, a calibration signal of some sort. Many times, people have ringing in the ears due to other causes. The fact that every time you go to a physician, he or she asks whether you have ringing in the ears is because there are certain tumors. For example, there are benign tumors that can press here on the uh, auditory nerve. It's called an acoustic neuroma. And when that occurs, it does not uh, lead to any damage of the sort that cancers can produce. But because it's lying very near the brain, it can do damage to the central nervous system. So it's important to get the tumor out. Most ringing of the ears has no known cause. It's what's called idiopathic, which means beats us. And <laughs> that's what you learn in medical school. Um, and that can also be due to certain drugs like quinine or aspirin taken in large doses for, for arthritis. We can take another question, sir. How long does the ear take to assimilate to a uh, more quiet environment by so speak, turning the amplifier on? Very good question, yeah. So the question is, how long does it take the ear to get used to a, a quieter envi environment, to adjust the amplifier? And there's something really neat there that's a general principle of sensory transduction that I did not have time to cover yesterday. The ear responds rapidly because it has a feedback system. The brain sends a separate set of nerve fibers back down from the brain stem to the ear, and they turn the knob. They can make the ear more sensitive. They can make the ear less sensitive. And most of our other senses have something comparable. For example, our muscle spindles that I mentioned to you yesterday can be adjusted by signals that descend from the nervous system and control their sensitivity. Someone over here? Yes. So the question is, what's the basis of perfect pitch? Is anything that I showed you today involved in that? And as far as we know, that's not the case. So Hermann Helmholtz, who was a great uh, German physicist about a century ago, uh, investigated that sort of problem. He was motivated by studies of music to try to understand how the ear's works work. And he is the person who first realized that the basilar membrane undoes the work of a piano. But in the course of that study, he and people since have not found anything special about people who have perfect pitch. That seems to be an ability that occurs higher up in the central nervous system. Interestingly, young children 
more often have perfect pitch than adults. It seems to be something that we're born with, or many people are born with, and unless it's trained, it's subsequently lost. We can take one last question. So um, you were talking about the, related to the perfect pitch, if they had this, this cochlea, the, the fake cochlea, would it give them, I mean, is it tuned in a way so that they have pitch, so that they hear only perfect pitches? Right. So, so the question is, what happens with the, the uh, artificial cochlea, the cochlear prosthesis? Would persons have uh, a perfect pitch or anything like it as a result of that device? I think the answer is no. The device gives a very attenuated and distorted input, as you heard, because instead of having 25,000 nerve fibers carrying information from 16,000 hair cells, you now ha only have, say, 20 channels of information. So the pitch information is is greatly blunted by that. So I'd like to thank you all, and we'll turn this back over to Dr. Perpich. I want to thank you, Jim, for a superb presentation on how hearing happens at the molecular and cellular level. Watching your video animation, I will listen to a Takata and Fugue with new respect for the workout it gives the basilar membrane of our cochlea. For the fourth and final lecture of the series, Dr. Jeremy Nathans will continue his focus on how our brain makes sense of sensory information when light strikes the 100 million photoreceptors in our retinas. As a 19th century poet put it, colors are the smiles of nature, and Dr. Nathan's lectures are showing you why. For all of you here in the auditorium, please be back in 25 minutes. For those of you in the television audience, we will once again run the video on our exhibit that we prepared on sight and sound for the 200 high school students who are here from Washington, D.C. area schools. And I also want to remind you, as Dr. Chopin, the president of the Institute, did yesterday, that we especially encourage you to check out our holiday lecture website. Please give us feedback, especially on the video um, laboratories for students that we developed with the help of one of our high school interns from a Washington, D.C. area high school. We look forward to having you join us in one half hour. Thank you very much.